I was downstairs uh, talking with two colleagues, and we were talking about... Drum roll, please. Drop off. College drop off. <laughs> it is the season of saying goodbye, of saying hello to new chapters, of dropping people off, yeah. of helping people move into new jobs, move into school, start a new grade. I guarantee you, either you or somebody that you love is going through a major change right now. They are starting at university and you're about to drop them off. They're going into their senior year of high school. That's what's happening here in the Robbins household with our son, Oakley. You've made a new sports team. Wow. And it's game on. Like, you actually made the Division One. Let's freaking go. Oh, no. Have you ever noticed that about changing? That you can be really excited about something. You can be excited about moving in with your boyfriend or girlfriend or significant other. You can be excited about the new job that you're starting in the fall. You can be excited about starting to finally date again after a divorce or a breakup. But you're also nervous. And so as we were starting to share stories around the island in the kitchen, there was so much meaty, amazing stuff happening. I'm like, everybody shut up. We're going upstairs. We're turning <laughs> on the microphones and we're talking about this. And this is an episode and a conversation for you, whether or not you have kids. This is an episode and a conversation for you, whether or not you have anybody going back to school or starting a new job because every single one of us has a very difficult time dealing with change. And we also get triggered by the people that we love who get triggered by change. And so let's just start with um, uh, Lynn, who is sitting right here to my right. And she was the one who started this domino fall by saying that you just dropped off your daughter in college. Yes, you know, it's heart-wrenching every time. I think it's just part of the process. I think it will be this way every year. Um, and I just know that this is part of what's going to happen, right? This is the transition. Yes. Um, Why is it heart-wrenching for you? Um, seeing emotion from either of my children. I had this with my firstborn as well. Um, Dropping him off the first year, he thought he made the biggest mistake, chose the wrong school because he did not know a soul. Mm. And it's really scary to leave them in a state of, you know, kind of emotional distress. Yes. It is so hard. And I didn't do the right thing the first time around. What did Let you do? Let me just say. Let's hear the big mistakes. <laughs> okay. Like, lay it on us. <laughs> oh, everything went wrong because I was so sucked into the emotions that he was feeling that I was crying, I was upset, I was not strong for him at all. Yeah. I wasn't encouraging him, I was wanting to take him home. You were in it with him. I was so in it with him. I get and that. I, yeah, and I think I learned that I am an empath, so <laughs> I take on the emotions of other people. Um, I mean, a dog trainer told me once that I was, you know, the weak link, so. <laughs> uh, it's true, I was then the weak link, because anytime anybody else was suffering, or upset, or I thought I was putting somebody into this uncomfortable place, um, I just fell apart and I had to save them. And I was robbing them of the opportunity to rise up and deal with change because we all have to learn how to do that. So right. as I you know, went through this with my son and now with my daughter, although they're two different people, um, I know that the best thing to do for them is to encourage and to just remember and remind them of the skills they have to rise up, to be able to handle anything, you know, and it makes them stronger adults. So, so what did you do differently? Dropping mm -hmm. off your daughter the last couple days mm -hmm. that you screwed up with your son at that first drop off? Oh yeah, that's clear. <laughs> uh, dropping off my daughter, even though she was still emotional and loves her school, like right. really excited to get back, loves her school, but it's a new, you know, new living situation, mm -hmm. new people surrounded by new people. Um, but what I did differently is that it's more of a encouragement that you've got this. I don't show my emotion, even though she's emotional. I just something just has to turn off in my brain and let her be emotional, mm. understand that this is her transition. And I reminded Sounds her. Sounds like you're being a cold bitch. Is I, that yeah, what you did? I, I, you're literally I do like, feel, I'm flipping yes. off the weak link with the dog uh, trainer yeah. empath mode. And I'm like. Pfft. Yeah, it is. Is that really that, what? Because yeah, I kind of got this sense like where you're like, I'm yeah. turning this 
off. Yeah. Yes. But you know, I will say this, if you don't mind, yeah. just to hit pause on that story, because that's what my mom did to me when I went for my year, quote unquote, abroad. I went to Hawaii for a semester and I was leaving. I will never forget this. I was getting on the plane by myself. How old are you? Like 18, 19 years old, right? And I was so scared. I could almost feel like my voice trembling now. I can really get in touch with how afraid I was. And I remember I looked at my mom and I said, well, I can always come back if it doesn't work out, right? <laughs> and you, you know my mom. She said, no. Yeah. She said, you can't come back. What? You better make this work out. Let me tell you, though. That's the best Are you thing. It is the best me? thing. Yeah. It is it the best It was the thing. best thing. Because if she had said, yeah, give me a call if in five days it doesn't work out. Give me a call if your stomach is out of control with anxiety. Give me a call if you find yourself in the psychiatrist's office, all of which happened, right? <laughs> <laughs> if she would have said that, I would have given her a call and I wouldn't have given it a go, right? right? I would have kept looking back to my mom to see, is it time to go home yet? Can I be done now? This is so hard. And instead, I looked forward at the volcanoes of Hawaii, all the new people I was going to meet, my roommates and all that stuff. Wow. And I was able to look forward. And it was cold hearted. Right? Like it, it was terrible. Right. But, but you do I need believe that. Yeah. You do. You really do. Yeah. And dropping my daughter off the first year, she said, I made a mistake. Can I come home? Yeah. And I said, no, definitely not. She said, what about after the first semester? And I said, no, nope, definitely not. And she's, you know, I said, you have to make it go a go of it for a whole year. You have to give it your yeah. all. You've spent yeah. a whole year choosing this school and you won't know, you won't know oh. until a year to, you know, to experience everything. And that's yeah. what she needed wow. to hear. What are you thinking about now? I, 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 I literally probably look like I'm going number two. I have such a <laughs> stunned look on my face. I'm realizing I needed this conversation, and I'll tell you why. Um, I hate feeling people in distress. And I remember when we dropped off uh, our oldest, Sawyer, and she won't mind telling me, uh, she manages her discomfort around transitions by making lists and mm -hmm. organizing. Mm -hmm. She was packed, color coordinated, had reached out to roommates to pick out the bedspreads. She had mason jars selected for all of the office supplies <laughs> she would never use, all lined up. Oh. And I remember pulling into Boston College and she just froze. And we set up her room and she was completely disassociated. You could tell she had left her body she was having an out-of-body experience. We, I'll, I, I remember this moment where she was sitting up on her bed, and we, of course, had to buy the little stands that lift up the bed to <laughs> put the dressers underneath yep. it. And so she's sitting there. She looked like a little kid because her feet were dangling on top of this big <laughs> bed that we had lifted up with the things from Bed Bath & Beyond. And, oh, my God. And I said to her, are you okay? And she said, no, I, I think I made a mistake. I don't yeah. think I can do this. I, this doesn't feel right. And I said, well, why? Do you want to go do something? Instead of saying, no, we've moved you in. It's time to face it. And so we drove into Boston and we walked around the container store and a Target and we had the world's worst kind of early dinner <laughs> trying to kill time as you could tell that she just didn't want to go back and it was a major mistake and I remember when we dropped off Kendall at USC again I love what you just said about the fact if you spend a year picking this place you have to give it a year I think that's a good barometer for a job too yeah and or let, for grade school like if you spent a year working up to this next mm -hmm. grade give it a year yes before you re think like oh this you know like I'm, I'm still afraid I'm not going to make this happen you, yes you, you yeah. spent a year yes I love that yeah. and I remember how hard it was for Kendall to get into this program I've talked about it on this this podcast that it was like winning American Idol and, mm -hmm. and division one recruiting to get into mm -hmm. this pop music major program at USC it's all she wanted to do this was her dream we got out there she was a blubbering mess yeah. sobbing like just clinging to you when you were yeah. saying goodbye and we're like we gotta go we're, we're actually flying out we gotta go and then of course I get upset and 
I do think getting sucked into their nervousness, which is normal, is destabilizing for them when you're not strong through it. Yes, like there's a way to validate, hey, and one of the things that I wanted to share with you guys immediately is steal this. All three of us have one major takeaway from this, and it's that one of the things that you can say to somebody is, of course you're upset. This is your process for going through change. Mm -hmm. You always do this. You always think and get so excited, and then you get there and you don't like it. This shows me that you're mentally well. This shows me that you're going through your process. This makes me feel good that you're sad, uh, even though you thought you'd be excited because this is what you always do before any major change that turns out great. Yeah. And so you got to ride the wave because this is part of your process. Don't expect it to be exciting. And I think that's part of why these changes are so hard for people because you literally build them up like sophomore year, junior year, life after college is going to be freaking awesome. I'm moving to New York City. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And then this thing that you've just built up in your mind is coming at you and you go, this doesn't feel like I thought it was going to feel no, at all. And then you freak out. Why? Because it's new. That's why it doesn't feel like what you thought it would feel. Mm -hmm. What you think it's going to feel like in your mind is very different than how your body experiences it as it's happening. Mm -hmm. And I need this conversation and I realize it because one week from today, our daughter is moving back to Los Angeles to start life after college. And just yesterday, I was saying goodbye to seven of her best friends from USC who had come from her birthday weekend and they were all getting teary eyed because some are going in one direction, others are going in the other direction. And I remember that moment so well mm -hmm. from my own life when everybody scatters and you go to yourself, things are never going to be the same again because we're never going to be in the same place again mm -hmm. at the same time, yeah. living yeah. all together. And right. my life is moving forward whether I want it to or not. And so Chris is flying out a week from today to help Kendall move into her first big girl apartment and start life. And Sawyer is leaving in 22 days for this trip she's been saving for for five years to go travel in Asia alone. Mm -hmm. And you know what she's doing right now? She's making lists. She's not <laughs> buying mason jars no. because she can't take them in her backpack. But <laughs> lists, you gotta embrace the lists, everybody. Lists yeah. and lists yeah, and yeah. lists and lists. Yeah. Why? That's her process. Yeah. Yes. And you want to know what else I know? What do you think is going to happen when she lands in the very first country that she arrives in <laughs> on the trip she has dreamt about taking for a decade? Yeah. Did she so? reach out to you? Oh, she yeah. made a mistake. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 This happened with your yeah. daughter. Yeah. Absolutely. When yeah, she I took her a... gap year. Yeah, she took her gap year and she was in Spain. She was in Malaga. We all went over. Our whole family went there to drop her off. She was ready as could be. But when there comes that time when you say goodbye to the old and you're ready to face the new, right? Mm -hmm. You're in the terror barrier. Yeah. You're like, I can't do this. Yeah. What am I going to do? So, and, and I felt like I was like Lynn about to get swept up because right. we dropped her off early in the morning, but it was, uh, it was a Sunday morning. So everybody was out partying the night before and there were drunk pe people, you know, still drunk in the, on the streets of Malaga. And she walked us to our, our cab and <gasps> we were just like, we're leaving her here. Yeah. You feel like the worst mom how, in the world. Right? How, right? Yeah, I know. Do you feel how like you're deserting you do your that? child? And she felt like, I can't do this, mom. I'm going to get emotional Ugh. because here's why. Because I realized in that moment, I have to believe in her more yes. than she believes in herself. Yes. And she has to borrow that from me or someone else. I mean, what a beautiful thing as a parent that mm. we can say, yes, you can. Mm -hmm. Not in a mean way, not in a judgy way, not in a shamey way, but just like, yes, you can. Yeah. You will triumph. Yes. You will look back at this and say, 
Isn't that so funny? Yeah, <laughs> I thought no, I that's, couldn't. That's that's amazing because yeah. it's true. They need encouragement. Yeah. They just need you to be confident, not sucked into the the emotion. Yes. And just be okay with the yes. emotion. Like that we're not okay when we see somebody upset, right? That's right. hard. Right. But you know on the other side of that, if you encourage, yeah. they are go- they are going to triumph. So They are. They are. In their own way. Yeah. And then yeah. they move up that ladder of life and right. they like yeah. do four months in Spain and then the next thing you know like they're yeah. doing something else really awesome right. I'm not gonna no, figure yeah. out what she's gonna do next but you know yeah. um I think this is a great time to take a quick pause I want to unpack that when we come back so stay with us yeah I gotta get a Kleenex so. <laughs> and noodles at the door we'll be right back <laughs> welcome back I'm Mel Robbins and I'm here with my two friends and colleagues Amy and Lynn and we are all moms with kids that are college age and post-college age and high school seniors and Mm -hmm. uh, high school freshmen. High school freshmen. And we are talking about what it's like to help somebody you love go through a major change. And of course, it's drop-off season. It's new job season. It's start life after college season. And you probably either have somebody in your household that is either going into a new grade or getting dropped off at a school or getting moved into their big person apartment for their big first job. And those moments of goodbye are so triggering because, well, first of all, I think we all agree we can't stand to see people that we love in pain. And for me personally and selfishly, I don't know about you two, but it always reminds me of those moments when I had to say goodbye to my parents. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And it makes me re experience that terror that you can feel when suddenly the people that you love walk out the door and there you are alone in your apartment or in your dorm room and you're in this new life. <laughs> or I even remember when I was in nursery school. I literally right. remember being you in do? nursery school. And my mom leaving. I remember that too. You yeah. do? It was traumatic. Very yeah. traumatic. Yep. Yeah. Now every young mom listening right now is like, we've just scarred her for life or him. Or <laughs> well, they... maybe we show him a better way to do it though. Yes. You know? Like, I mean, if we what if you could prep the kid and say, you know, like you can do this and I know that this is gonna be hard, but use that bridge, right? Like when I see you again, you are going to have been to preschool for the first time. Isn't that exciting? Right? That is a huge takeaway. So I want to make sure we take a highlighter and highlight it. Amy's sharing a technique that tons of psychologists and researchers talk about, which is creating a bridge between this moment and something in the future. And they always say that when you drop a little one off at a daycare or school, you build that bridge and are like, I'm going to see you tonight. I'll be here to pick you up. You're going to have a great day playing with your friends and I'm going to come back and then we're going to do this. And the same thing, I'll see you at Thanksgiving. I'll see you in a couple months when I come visit. I'll see you in a, in a week or so. And so creating a bridge is a wonderful way to provide that emotional stability. And I also want to take a minute and highlight two things. Lynn was talking about this ability that she's created right when she dropped her daughter off this year to switch gears and to feel that pull like oh my god I'm going in I'm going to the tidal wave and then flip into a mode of strength and Amy I keep thinking about what you said which is the way that you show up in those moments allows the people that you love to borrow your belief in them yeah, I love that. That is so cool. Yeah. I mean, it's so important. I know I really needed that when I was little, and I don't know that I got it all the time. And I know when I did receive it, I did so much better. Mm-hmm. You know, I really was able to ground myself in the understanding that I could do it rather than panic about not being able to do it. So, I think borrowing confidence from other people mm. is is a life skill. Mm. Because you're not only managing other people through change, 
you have to learn how to manage yourself through change, yeah. mm -hmm. right? You have to learn how to manage yourself through even just the day-to-day -day stuff. The hot water's not working. Like, how am I going to do this? You know, all these little things and big things. How can I do this? And if you're overwhelmed, it's going to be a lot harder. But if you have even just a sliver of confidence, you know, even just like a little light through the crack of that disbelief that you have, there's a light of confidence like, well, I handled something like this before. I did freshman year, maybe sophomore year I could do, right? Like I did nursery school, first grade's going to be a little bit better maybe. If you can get that confidence somehow, either from somebody else or something that you've done in the past, I don't know, that's how I manage myself. And that's, I think, what I'm teaching my kids. Yeah. I had never thought about it that way. Like that the role in that moment of drop off is to act in a way where you're exuding confidence in their ability. Yeah, you acknowledge this is gonna be really hard. And you're right, junior doesn't feel like sophomore year did. And you're not mm -hmm. living with the same people. And you know, the same people aren't on campus and people have graduated. So it's not gonna be exactly the same, but it could be even better. And this is gonna be hard and I, believe in you and I believe when I see you again you're gonna be doing great and I love you and I miss you and then look them in the eye give them a big old hug and kiss then turn around and pretend you actually feel all those things as you walk away <laughs> right you gotta walk yeah away you without do. sobbing yes. and running back for that hug like I always do do not do that move yes no right. that's that's kiss of death yeah kiss yeah. of death <laughs> yeah. well I want to turn to you, Lynn, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but you're doing this for yourself because you left a job where you were for 10 years, very successful, and you are brand new to our team. And you're here in Vermont at our, the first offsite that we've had where you've been on the team. How are you coaching yourself through a big transition? Because, you know, we've been talking about being that confidence you know what I'm saying for yeah. someone else? How are you doing it for yourself? Because you don't even look slightly uh, well, nervous. You know, I think I am um, because you always wonder, right? That little piece, that little voice in your head that will say, am I the right person? Is this the right opportunity? Um, but I just don't give myself permission to, to listen to that voice. I don't. I just know that I'm I've been capable before of transition. I am not afraid of change, even though it's uncomfortable. I know I can do it. So I just keep telling myself that. And it's interesting you ask because I mentioned to my daughter this morning, I'm going through all these things too. You know, even as upset as you are, I know this is going to be perfect. Like you're going to, you loved last year. Right. And I didn't even know if she would get emotional this year. I was kind of hoping I'd escape it. <laughs> but, um, you know, I did it. More and practice so, for you. Lynn. Yeah. Yeah. But it's you know, it's perfect because now I have something I can say to her that, mm. you know, I'm going through all this, too. I don't know if the team's going to like me or if I'm going to be the right person for this job, but I'm going for it. And I'm just telling myself that I know I can do it just the way you can. And you are going to thrive this year. And she feels so confident. I know just in the responses that I get from her, that that gives her that, that little boost of confidence that she doesn't quite yet have for herself. Mm. But over college transitions, job transitions, every transition, if we as the parents can do that for them, to just, like you said, you know, be that, that voice kind of giving them that confidence that, you know, maybe they just need that little push. Eventually they'll do it for themselves, yeah. you know, and they won't need us. And then they'll be doing it for their kids. And One uh, other thing that I'm realizing um, talking to you guys is I think one of the reasons why I've always been so triggered in these goodbye moments is because I left home at 18 uh, and I never moved back. Wow. wow. Like I left Michigan to go to Dartmouth and it's not like I can drive home for a weekend. Mm, right. And... So I would only see my parents on the big holidays. Wow. And then I stayed on the East Coast for jobs and for internships and never went home. And so I think part of what I carry into these transitional moments, like I am thanking God I'm not the one moving Kendall <laughs> in because right. these stir up so yes. much for me like am I ever going to see you again does this mean you're going to live in LA forever and I know intellectually I just want you to live wherever you are happy mm -hmm. 
I'm not going to, and you know, and I, I, as much as I want you to be my next door neighbor, which I would love, and I'd love to be in a business with my kids. I'd love to see them every day. Um, I can't lay that on them. Mm -hmm. And so it brings up so much for me when my kids are, you know, when Sawyer goes and travels in the back of my mind, it will be, oh God, are you going to meet somebody as you're traveling? Are you going to live in Asia? Are you going to be so far away? Because I miss my parents terribly. Like one of the things that I hate the most about having raised our kids in Boston is that my parents weren't around. Mm -hmm. And because they're still in Michigan. And so I think that's also part of what makes it so difficult for me. And I love what you two are sharing because it's given me a new way other than shove down the trauma. Don't, don't, don't yes. let your shit get on their <laughs> shit. It's given me a different way to think about it. That you as a friend, as a family member, as a parent, as a partner, you have the ability to display confidence on someone's behalf. Yes. And that allows them to borrow it. Now, I always then sob in the car. That's a good you know move. Saying, or in the airplane oh, seat. Oh, yeah. Right. Or Power whatever. mom move. Yeah. 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 But that was really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So when I had this huge transition and we moved up here to southern Vermont, and we did it because our son wanted a change. He did not want to go to high school in Boston. Mm -hmm. And it was in the middle of the world being turned upside down. And we were like, okay, we'll try it. Mm -hmm. And he changed overnight. And so we decided to go all in. Mm -hmm. And I came here kicking and screaming. Yep. Anxiety attack after anxiety attack. There is no Target, no Walmart here. How am I going to live here? There are 3,000 people here. Are you kidding me? The nearest airport is an hour and a half. What the fuck are we doing? Like I was yeah. just a toddler yep. throwing a temper tantrum for months. Yeah. And then I don't even know what made me do it. It was probably an act of desperation. I was spiraling so badly through this transition that I wrote on a post-it note all of the reasons why we were here mm -hmm. that I needed to remind myself of. I'm going to grab it because I think it's still in my office. And oh. I'm going to, and I'm kind of scared to read it because I was in a pretty bad state. That's where But happens. I used this to rescue myself. Let me get okay. <laughs> I am so excited to see this. I don't know why I'm doing this to myself. Because you are inspiring people, Mel, to transition. Because if they lean on the pain, they can come in the other way. Okay. So here it is. I got to figure out maybe... Uh, you want to put I, it here? What did I put on the table? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's do it. I put it on the table. Okay. Oh, my God. Let's do this. Oh my God, I'm so excited. Oh my God, this was in my office, you guys. I would walk up here, I would wake up in the morning and I would look out the window at this gorgeous view where you don't see a single building or a single human being. Yeah. And I would say to myself something empowering like, why the fuck did I do this? <laughs> I was lonely and disconnected in Boston. How the hell am I gonna feel better. And then I'd be like, no, 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 there's something in you. And I'd walk up to my office and I'd be wiping away the tears. And so here is what I would remind myself of my values. At the top, this is, I just said my why. Number one, you're here for peace and feeling deeply connected to my life, love, and mission. Look at that. Just pause in there. What do you feel when you say that to yourself? Um, it's true. Like I, when I wrote this, I wanted to believe that. Mm -hmm. but, but first we don't believe it, by the way, right? When we first identify our values, you're so scared of living a value-driven life that I bet in the beginning, 
you're still had those fears. Like the brain wants to fight transition so hard than that narrative. Like there's no Walmart, there's no Target, there's no this, but I want peace. But how about the Walmart, right? <laughs> it is so true because it happens to all of us. Yes. Right. In that moment, identifying our values, shedding that light, like in, into what matters most, but then it takes action to live that life but can share one more at least i want to hear oh, more I, I can read them all more time having fun with family and friends and spend more time with oakley and chris look at that connection it's connection. incredible uh build a simple beautiful and elegant business model that runs like a clock and makes me happy and able to do my best work do you know what i love about that one if i may reflect a little bit the val the skill that i talk a lot in my book is called align Align is the idea of aligning values and action. But I believe in an aligned life where your job and your family and connection, they all come together. It's like an orchestra playing so that your job is not rubbing you from your family mm. and your family is not taking time away from your job because it's well orchestrated. I love this because you're basically saying the multiple parts of my values have to all fit. And it's like, value pie is how I see it. It's almost a slice of a pie, of a pizza pie. Yeah. And, you know, connection and, and your business, like your values, and they're all fitting together. This is, this is why you're so happy. I can see it. Oh, I'm a different human being. And I need to just say, when I wrote this, I was sobbing hysterically, convincing myself that moving here was the biggest mistake I'd ever made. And I wrote this as an act of desperation. I think Amy might have even been here that day. And just like, I got to put a beacon out. I got to remind myself why. In the, in the storm of my mind, I have to be able to see on a fucking wall. I mean, this is a huge, like one of these big sticky post-it things if you're not watching this on YouTube with us and you're listening to us. And I took a Sharpie out and I wrote this. And then I wrote Global Impact through higher leveraged use of my time, entertaining and impacting and changing lives. And then I wrote, have fucking fun. See friends every day. Hi, Jesse and Amy. I see my <laughs> close friends every day. And travel for fun with family and friends, not just for work. Look at that. Look at that. And I fucking did it. Like I, I literally wrote this shit down, went in the middle of a breakdown, and I've spent the last two years slowly, day by day, transforming this business and transforming my habits and my mindset to align with this thing that did not exist when I wrote it. That's it. See, you leaned against the pain right? You're in the middle of tears. And what people want to do when they're in tears, they want to avoid. You basically said, why? And I want a gin and tonic. That's yeah, what I wanted. When I was for saying. sure. Yeah, why not? Let's numb out. it out. Yes, Let's numb that's it out. right. I was avoiding it. Right. But Mamel, if you drive, if you create the life aligned with values, then you're in flow state all the time. You know, if you're going to have discomfort anyhow, so I say to people, if you're going to have those tears anyhow, might as well use them. Why the fuck feel bad and not use that pain in a way that actually gets you unbind? And this, and you're proof of it. Two years. Oh, oh, and then on the other side of this list, I have this like way to break down the fear because it was just all fear. I mean, this was all brand new. I was reinventing everything. I was going through a major transition like the rest of the world was too. And even though I had all these values written down on one side of this post-it note, the fear was just overwhelming. And so I gave myself this little cheat sheet that I would notice the bitch inside me and the fear. And then I made myself this promise. And this aligns so much with your work. And we had not even met yet. It's two years ago. Don't run. Yeah. It's incredible because what I see here is what we've been talking about, this idea of you don't want to feel your feelings, but we have to feel our feelings, right? You cried to write this. And then you said, approach. Don't run as a poach. Stay with it right? But stay with it in a value-driven way. All right. Question one, how did you successfully transition from being one of the many voices on social media and podcasts discussing everyday life challenges to becoming a prominent figure in the self-help industry? Catherine wants to know, can you share your insights into the strategies that helped you propel to this level? 
Yeah, I think one of the biggest insights is um, if everything is important, nothing is. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to have a game plan for a year about what is going to be the singular focus that you're going to really care about the most because you can't care about everything. And so if you think about my career, there's a lot that's public and a lot that's private. So the public facing things in my career are what everybody sees. It's the 10 million followers. It's the you know hit podcast. It's the books that I've published. But that's not the heart and soul of my business. I have been um, leapfrogging. Remember that game where you hop over the next person and they hop over? I've been leapfrogging my way to the position that I'm in now. It's been a toggle between things that I do publicly and things that are happening in the background. So a lot of people don't realize that I was for many years the most sought after and booked female speaker on the corporate circuit. I did nothing but go to stages around the world working with the world's biggest brands at these massive sales events or corporate retreats, speaking and teaching and sharing research and training people. And that's where I gained all my expertise is the work I was doing privately that nobody knows about. That's where I started to gain a huge following and a tremendous level of respect and all of this sort of uh, skill that was, that was being built in the background. And so what I wanna really have you think about is what is the one thing that you would wanna focus on mastering this year? So about six or seven years ago, for me, the one thing I really wanted to master is I wanted to somehow figure out how to take the things going on in private and make it part of our social media strategy. And so I did what I always do with anything I'm trying new that I wanna master. I became a student of it before I executed it. And so I studied people six years ago that were doing really cool things on social media, like Gary Vaynerchuk. I started studying a lot of the viral companies that repackage and curate information, like Upworthy. I mean, there's so many OGs. Oh, I mean, yeah. now everybody has like kind of these viral strategies, but back in the day, that was not what everybody did. And so I was looking at EllenTube, I was looking at YouTube, I was picking everything apart and I was becoming a student of it. And then I started to apply what I was learning. When I got into the podcast business, I had done audiobooks and audiobook productions for partners like Audible, but I had never launched a podcast. And so I studied it for two years. I watched meticulously what my buddy Jay Shetty was doing. I watched meticulously what the number one female podcast host was doing, who is Alex Cooper, who is on Spotify. She uh, hosts a show called Call Her Daddy, but she's only on Spotify. And so I just meticulously watched the people that I really admired. I watched Howard Stern. I watched Delilah on radio, and I picked apart what they were doing. I became a student of it. And it took me two years, two years of studying, two years of managing a pivot in my business, but it was the number one thing that I was focused on. The thing that I'm focused on now is YouTube. Now that we launched our podcast and completely destroying it in terms of download numbers and success and reach and growth, now I'm pivoting and I'm now tearing apart YouTube because I see that as the single biggest way to reach more people. And so every move that I've made has been a combination of either something that I've picked privately, like I'm gonna be the number one female speaker in the world. That's what I'm gonna do. And then I became that. I'm gonna take all these private conversations and I'm gonna figure out how to put those on social media because these conversations between me and somebody at a grocery store or on a sidewalk are way more compelling yeah. than these things I'm saying on a stage. And then I'm like, I, I feel called to launch a podcast. There are 6 million podcasts on Spotify alone. How the hell am I gonna do this? How am I gonna like figure this out? How am I gonna change my business? Most podcasts don't make any money. If I stop speaking, where's the money gonna come from? How am I gonna pay for my team? And so I became a student of it. Now it's about YouTube. What is the kind of content we wanna create? What does it feel like? What, what, what do successful channels do? I don't want it to look like that. What do I? And so pick something for the year that you wanna master and become a student of it, then execute. That's my advice. You have a three-step approach to transitions. Can you walk us through it? 
So in transitions, you need to shift, approach, and align. First, you're going to shift your perspective. Learn to talk to yourself as your best friend. And you're talking about here. Notice the bitch and the fear, <laughs> right? I love it. That's shifting the way you're talking to yourself, mm. right? Second, you want to approach. Don't run. In transitions, go towards discomfort. Really lean in on living a comfortable, uncomfortable life. And three, align. Align values and action. So in the middle of transition, lean into the pain, list your values, and then create action items. And that's what you did actually, Mel, because I see items in this list, they're values, and then you're talking about building your business based on those values. And then go do it. Then go do it. The transition is going to be uncomfortable. There's no transition that doesn't have discomfort. But holding on to the old just keeps you stuck. I am getting so much out of this conversation, both for my own transitions that will come, but more importantly for where I am right now around supporting other people through transitions. Because as I listen to you talk about the fact that you need to, it wasn't flip. What was it? Re no, what was the first one? Shift. 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 You have to shift your perspective and your focus. You have to then approach which is leaning into the pain. That's where you're going to find your values. Yeah. That's where you're going to find the lessons. And then you align your actions with these new values that you identify through the pain of the transition, whether it's a breakup or graduation. And what I'm realizing is that the number of times that I have rushed in to try to save one of my kids from a hard period by fixing it all. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll give you the script. I'll do this. I'll, I'll call that person for you. I'm actually robbing them of what happens when you turn toward the thing that you're avoiding and the discomfort and you approach it. Absolutely. That's what, beautifully put. I mean, I just realized that if I try to make it okay for, let's just use the example of my daughter stepping out of something she loved dearly for four years and stepping into the big unknown, if I don't give her the space to feel all of the discomfort, she actually needs that discomfort right now. Mm -hmm. She needs it to discover something within herself. Yes. And if I remove it, I am also removing something she needs from her life. That's it. Wow. Yeah, you're robbing her from a chance of living her best life because you're, and in fact, what we do is we prolong people's pain because eventually it's going to hit, right? Eventually she has to go through the discomfort to find her values to live her most meaningful life. And wow. if you're going to feel uncomfortable anyhow, might as well do it right away. Holy cow. I'm just sitting here going, boy, did I fuck up at times. Which parents, <laughs> like I really robbed my kids of some of the lessons they needed. And that's why the lessons keep repeating, don't that's they? That's why the lessons keep repeating. And, and, and you did, Mel, because you love them so much. And I want everybody to hear this is important. You know, parenthood is hard. None of us are perfect. We're going to mess it up. You know, I have a, a, a friend um, who's a psychologist who has a joke that she says that every time she messes it up, she puts money in the therapy jar. She's like, I know they're going to need therapy. I might as well just put some money there because, you know, I'm the one messing it up sometimes. But that's just parenthood. That's how it goes. But we can actually prevent from doing that by just letting them live their lives and sitting with discomfort and actually modeling it. Like show your daughter this and say, create your own, mm. right? Create your own. I have love her create that this, idea. Right? Have, have her take I responsibility for it. Everybody should create one of these. We're going to take a photo of it and link it to the show notes so that you can see what I wrote sobbing two years ago about what my North Star was going to be. And it was all because of the pain. That's all because that of the pain. That made me bring the... What do I value? What is worth going through this pain for? And everything on the left-hand side of this post-it note and everything that'll be on your post-it note that you value will be worth going through the pain for. It is. And that's how we get to integration, right? For me, I had this moment that I just wanted to run from Harvard and Mass Gen. I was like, you know what? It's, it's like this small box and it's not aligned with impact. And so I wanted to like divorce it. I wanted to avoid it, right? And yet, there's this huge part of me. I, I'm an academic at heart. I think as an academic. And so I actually I wanted to avoid so bad that I called my boss up. And I have this incredible chair in psychiatry. He's amazing. And I said to him, I said, Mauricio, I'm done. Like, 
you know, this is causing me too much pain. It's too restricted. And I'm sobbing with a cheer, like sobbing on a Zoom call. And he paused and he says, what is the problem? I said, it's just too too small. Like everything has bureaucracy and, and like I can't just go do things. And he's like, so what I hear you saying is there's a part of it that you still like. And I said, yeah, I mean, I created all this training material for paraprofessionals and I really care about it. It's not like I don't care about training paraprofessionals. In fact, we need more workforce and that's the future. But like, I wanted to create a podcast. I want to write a book. And, and so I want to quit. And he's like, what if we just work to eventually decrease your percent effort? You're here a day or two a week. We can discuss what that looks like. And you don't have to give up being an associate professor. However, we are proud of you. We wanted to be an associate professor, but you also don't want to limit you, Luana. And, and like his ability to hold space, he could have done, he could set goal. He could have said, no way, you have to stay 100%. He held space. He did for me what I hope you do for your daughter. He let me sit in this conference and cry with him. And I said to him, I, I don't know. Like I came out of the conversation not knowing. And he said, you sit with it and figure it out. And, and so as I launch this new piece of my life, I will have the Harvard appointment. I'm going to stay and I'm negotiating with him how small that becomes and what it looks like. But I don't want to give that Why up. Why don't we teach a class together? We totally should teach a class together. I've been dying to teach a class. Oh, my God. Class. We should totally teach a class together. You know, we should create a Harvard X course together. That's what we should do. Do you know why? They have millions of people on Harvard X, and we can create a course Let's together. Let's do it. And they would totally love for us to be there together. We could elevate this and people could get certificates. We could even get them to give a better certificate for this class. So maybe we can train paraprofessionals together through Harvard X. I feel fear in a lot of different areas of my life, not mm -hmm. when I'm just in the air. Mm -hmm. So when I'm on the ground, how can I use this tool to ground myself, even I if I'm not sure the outcome of it? I love this. Okay. Great question. I want you to take out a notebook and you're going to write down any okay. single thing that makes you nervous. Could be anything. I mean, what? Give me a couple. Oh There's a long list, probably, but uh, off the top of my head, like something that I don't know. I really wish that I could beat the fear on is I recently moved, um, not that far, but there's a really nice yoga studio on my street that I like pass every day. And I just always think like, I need to be a part of a community of 20 somethings that are like-minded that, you know, I just, I've always loved yoga. I've loved the community it brings, um, but I cannot bring myself to sign up and I can't bring myself up. Like I just constantly think about the day I have to show up for my first class and it makes me way too anxious to even like go. This is an excellent example. And by the way, incredibly common and very relatable. Yeah. So I'm really glad you shared it. So you're going to do the exact same thing. We're going to create a confidence anchor. Because what I hear is I hear you want to do it. I hear mm -hmm. it pulling you and the nerves are keeping you back. So name the name something you're excited about. So like, can you pick like a coffee shop in your neighborhood that you love to go to and it's going to be your treat to get a nice latte when you're done? Yep. Do you yeah. want me to name it? Yeah, I do. It's called Thinking Cup. I love Thinking Cup. Now <laughs> you're going to close your eyes. What okay. color yoga tights are you wearing? Oh God. Maybe like... I have this really nice light blue ones that I always like to wear. I love it. And as a treat, because you went to this relaxing yoga class in your light blue tights, sweatshirt tied around your waist, yoga bag over your shoulder, standing at Thinking Cup. What did you order? Um, Probably like an iced oat milk latte. Love it. <laughs> love it. How do you feel? Yeah. As you're walking out of the Thinking Cup, having just completed that class and treating yourself to that. How do you feel right now? Like proud of myself for doing it. Awesome. There's your confidence anchor. Anytime you feel nervous, 
you're going to count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, to interrupt the nerves and create that starting ritual. And you're going to drop that confidence anchor. And what's going to happen is it's going to slowly retrain your mind that you're not nervous about joining that yoga studio. You're actually excited. And when you start to practice this confidence anchor, at some point you're going to find yourself walking down the street and there's the studio. And as that wave, because remember, it's automatic. That automatic response comes up because you're about to do something new. You get to choose whether your brain says no or yes. And using the confidence anchor in this research from Harvard in the five-second rule, you can flip that moment from one of stress to one that's something awesome because you have the power to make your brain say, yes, I'm excited to do that. And I'm going to walk in today and I'm going to sign up for that relaxing yoga class. And I am going to imagine how great I'm going to feel in my hot, amazing light blue yoga tights as I sip <laughs> that oak milk latte and walk out a thinking cup as my reward for getting it done. And that, my friend, is how you use science to conquer your fears and create the life that you love. And I have a feeling, Cameron, and I have a feeling for you listening to us too, that this little technique is not only going to help you tee up and knock off one thing after another, that you're afraid to do or nervous to do, whether it's jumping on a plane or walking into a yoga studio or asking somebody out or working on your side hustle, I think what it's actually going to do is not only get you in action, I think it's going to help you reprogram your mind because I don't think you realize, Cameron, how much feeling on edge and nervous is a default for you and how much it's actually holding you back and robbing you of the happiness you deserve. You have natural intelligence inside of you, and that may sound all woo-woo. This is science, and we're going to unpack this all the time because I'm going to keep coming back to the fact that you have instincts, you have hard wiring, your gut is trying to tell you something, and one of the fastest ways to read that natural intelligence is to pay attention to your energy. You have felt what I'm talking about. You know when things are off. You know when you feel depleted. You know when you naturally click with somebody. That is data that matters because it's data that helps you make the changes, the small changes that improve your life. The fourth thing that you've clearly learned is that the best things in life are reciprocal. Even volunteering. Volunteering is a reciprocal act. You want to know why? When you volunteer and you volunteer your time, you volunteer your energy, you donate money, you always receive something in return, don't you? You feel this sense of meaning. You feel connected to something larger and more important than your day-to-day struggles. That is a reciprocal energy exchange. You donate money, you volunteer your time and effort and resources, you get something invaluable back. That's reciprocal. That's why it adds meaning. The best friendships, reciprocal. You, you pour in, they pour back. Same thing with your romantic relationships. And All you need to do is to think about that one person you chased, right? That you're constantly going after. Should I text now? Are there all the energy going at them? And yeah, maybe you got an orgasm back, but then mostly you got negativity because you're constantly insecure, constantly worried, no idea where you stood, always stressed out about it, thinking about it, distracted by it. That is not a reciprocal relationship. That is an obsession that's unhealthy for you. So there are things in life that are really hard, that take a lot of energy, things that I hate doing, things like exercise. I hate exercising. I hate getting out of bed. But once I push through that resistance, right, you learned all about this in the episode called Motivation is Garbage. Once you get the activation energy and you do the thing, what happens after you exercise? You get a reciprocal return of positive energy. You feel great about yourself. The same thing's true about my husband who doesn't drink right now. It takes a lot of effort. At least it did in the beginning. And it was really hard because he had been drinking for a long time. But even though it's hard, 
it's so worth it. Why? Because there is this reciprocal return. You start to feel so good about yourself. You sleep better at night. You have clarity, you have pride. You're, you're aligned with your values. And that values word is really important because when it becomes even more nuanced, your values is how you're going to create a return of energy in really hard situations. So I can give you two examples. Any one of you who is caring for an aging parent knows how difficult that is. Any one of you that has a child or a partner who is struggling with mental health issues knows how difficult that is. You also know that you are pouring your energy into caring for this person. And it can be very depleting because the person that is sick or the person that's struggling doesn't often give back what you're pouring in. It also may be physically demanding because you're working all the time, plus you're doing this at night. And so you are tired. It's a fact. So how in those situations do you create this exchange of energy? The secret is values. Tap into your values in order to create positive energy back and to help you rise above the day-to-day stresses that are temporary. Because the truth is, if you tap into your values, it makes you feel like an amazing human being, knowing that you are there for your mom. It makes you feel like a good person, knowing that you are a compassionate caregiver that is helping your child or your partner through a really difficult chapter. When you start to feel depleted, remind yourself, lift your gaze, raise your gaze, and look out to the future and feel proud of yourself for acting in alignment with the kind of person you know yourself to be, even though it's hard. That's how you create a positive energy return for yourself in those situations where somebody either doesn't have it to give back or the situation itself is really physically demanding. I'll give you another example. Um, I have a friend that is going through a hard time and has been for a long time. And I continue to pour into this friendship, even though I don't get a lot back. Why? The reason why is I get a lot back knowing that if I were in this situation, I would want a friend of mine to stay around and pour into me. And that is what drives me. That creates that energy exchange. And so you have within you the ability to do things that feel hard, like exercising or stopping drinking or staying sober or changing your habits or making cold calls. You can do those things that feel difficult And trust me, you're going to feel proud of yourself, which is why they return on the investment of effort. And you can do things that are draining. And I promise you, they will come back to you with energy because it makes you feel good about yourself. And I bet you can think of four or five things that you're doing right now that are hard that you're not even giving yourself credit for. You should be proud of yourself because you're a good person. You keep showing up. And that is something you need to celebrate. That's something that you need to feel energized about. And in those times when it gets really hard, remind yourself, this too shall pass. That what goes up also comes down. Just like when you're hiking a trail on a mountain. That this is a season of your life. And holding on, holding on to what doesn't serve you is going to drain you. It's going to kill off your happiness. But... Finding ways to bring energy back in in those situations that are aligned with your values and what you want, that's a power move. Today's topic is the three lessons that I have learned from one of the hardest years of my life. And I wanted to do a episode uh, about the lessons that I've learned recently because this has been a really freaking hard year for me. And there are so many of you that listen to this podcast that are new friends of mine that have met me after the podcast is launched. And you may find it surprising 
to hear that this has been a really, like, I'm talking, if I had to rate zero to 10, how hard it was, zero being this was a cakewalk, 10 being this sucked sour eggs, this year would be beh, about a 97 on a scale from zero to 10. And if you listen to me today, you think, well, how could that possibly be? You've got one of the top ranking podcasts in the world. You've come out of nowhere and are just crushing it, Mel. You seem to have it all going on. You're clearly a very positive person. How could this possibly have been the hardest year of your life? Well, you're seeing me after the hardest year. And, you know, when you think about a lot of the kind of cheesy metaphors in life, it's always the darkest right before dawn. It's always hard right before it gets easy. And I think one of the things that's true about life is that life requires you to get lost right before you find yourself again. And I'm not going to lie to you. It sucks when you feel loss. It sucks when life is hard. There is nothing fun about it. I do not wish it on anybody. And I also know that it is unavoidable, that there are going to be years of your life that are absolutely amazing and delicious and easy, and they're going to just flow like water flows out of a faucet. And then there are going to be years like the year I just had that nearly suck you dry. It's like the hits just keep coming. And so I'm going to just, at a top level, tell you some of the reasons why this year was super hard for me. And even preparing to talk to you about this, thinking about what life looked like just over a year ago, I started to get emotionally triggered just talking about, like just talking about how hard it's been makes me feel stressed out again. So, you know, let me just kind of go back, boy, about a year. So a year from now, I was so burnt out. I had been running on adrenaline for years. The more successful I became, the more unhappy I was. For two years, I had been living separately from my husband and our son because we had raised our kids in Boston, and that's where my business was. And during the pandemic, remember that? Oof. During the pandemic, uh, our son made this decision that he wanted to go to school in southern Vermont. And so my husband and our son were living with my mother-in-law, and he was going to the public school three hours away from me in southern Vermont. And I was down in Boston working. And so I was living alone. I was not near my husband and son. I would see them on the weekends. I was driving back and forth. And it was just beating me up. On top of that, there was some stuff going down at work that was super painful. I had somebody very close to me that betrayed me. I mean, they stole from me. They lied to me. And it had been going on for a while, and it all kind of blew up a year ago. And so here I am feeling lonely, feeling burnt out. I'm looking at a massive betrayal, and I don't know if any of you have ever had that experience where somebody deeply in your inner circle steals from you, lies to you, does something to you like that, but it is, it just takes you to your knees. And I was super just unhealthy. I had not been exercising consistently. I was grabbing the alcohol to relieve the stress and loneliness. And I, in preparing to talk to you about this today, I went back through my camera roll and back through my calendar. And, you know, it's a wake-up call because you kind of forget how bad things are once you get through it. I mean, when you're in the soup of it, you feel like you're drowning in sludge. But when you get through it, it's almost like uh, after you have a baby, you forget the pain of labor. Looking back at my photos from last year, seeing me so worn down, I looked so pale. I looked like a dolphin. You know how dolphins have gray skin? 
I had no brightness to my face. The life force was just drained out of me. And, you know, that's just kind of the tip of the iceberg. I was in therapy. I was trying to sort stuff out, but I was just miserable. And if I'm being honest, I had been miserable for a while. I had just been pushing through. Life felt very hard. And I knew deep down that something had to give. I knew that I could not continue to go on living separate from Chris and Oak, going back and forth, feeling so burnt out, surrounding myself uh, with friendships or relationships where I wasn't feeling supported. I was actually getting betrayed. And I knew I had to do something. And it may surprise you to hear me say, I just felt stuck. And I had all these excuses for why I had to keep going and all these excuses for why I, you know, couldn't like change things. And I also felt like this was getting done to me. I don't know if you've ever heard that quote that oh, life is happening for you. I, I hate that quote because I'm like, no, it's not. Life is happening to me. Don't tell me when my life isn't working that this is happening for me. Screw you. Well, then something happened. What happened is in December... I had a conversation with a really good friend of mine and my friend's name is Pete Sheehan and he's known me for a long time. <clears throat> and he said, you know, Mel, you are more miserable than I have ever heard you. And I think that it's time that you truly get control of this, that you focus on your happiness that you make some serious changes. And this brings me to lesson number one. You ready? Lesson number one from the hardest year of my life is that your life is always trying to teach you something. You may not want to learn what it's trying to teach you, but your life is always trying to teach you something. Whether life is going easy, it's trying to teach you something. You know what life is teaching you when life is easy? It's teaching you what works. It's teaching you the habits and the kinds of people that make you feel good. It's teaching you what life working looks like. And you know what life is teaching you when life is hard? It's teaching you what is broken. It's trying to wake you up. And what I've learned the hard way, do not do what I did. I am so damn stubborn. Like if you think about life as a giant school, life is the greatest school you will ever attend. You can enjoy it, you can hate it, but life is always going to be school because life is always teaching you something. And do not make the mistake that Mel Robbins makes because I'm a very stubborn student. And what happens is if you don't get the lesson that life is trying to teach you, life just brings out the sledgehammer. And that's what happened to me. It just hit me over the head with a freaking sledgehammer. And so I want you to stop for a second right now. And I want you to think, what is my life trying to teach me right now? And here's a simple exercise that my friend Pete gave me. It's so dead simple, it's, it's kind of nuts. You're going to take out a piece of paper. He said, Mel, take out a piece of paper. And I, I'm, I have my journal here. You can hear me like flipping it open right now because this is like what actually happened. December 21st, Last year, I was speaking with my friend, Pete Sheehan. I got to find the page here. I should have put a little, uh, oh, here it is right here. Um, and he said, Mel, I want you to draw a line down the center of a page. And on the left-hand side, for the little ears, I apologize, but this is what it says, shit I hate. On the right-hand side, things I love. I want you to write down everything that is not working that you hate about your life. And here's a nicer way to say it. Where in your life do you feel friction? Where in your life do you feel friction? It could be in your body. It could be in your relationships. It could be at work. It could be when you look at your bank account. Where is life creating friction? It's hard. You're frustrated. Everything feels like a fight. This is where the lesson is, everybody. Friction is how your life teaches you 
to wake up and pay attention. Friction is where your life is trying to hit you with a sledgehammer because life wants you to be happy. Life wants you to feel good about yourself. Life wants you to enjoy yourself. Life wants you to live in alignment with what's meant for you. And you see, when you feel friction, I felt friction in every single aspect of my life. I felt friction in my body. I felt friction in my mental health. There was not a place when I sat down to do this exercise, what do I hate, where there was not friction. That's how bad it was. I wrote, I hate packing on a Sunday and leaving my family to drive home and be alone. I hate flying alone. I hate working alone. I hate being stuck somewhere and not being able to get home. I hate the fact that I feel like I've got to generate all the ideas and keep going and going and going and that I can't stop. I hate feeling insignificant. I hate feeling disconnected. I hate feeling like I'm just going with no plan. I hate feeling disorganized and dropping balls and ADHD and lack of support on the administrative side of my life. I hate feeling overwhelmed. I hate having to set up technology. I hate never seeing my friends. I hate not knowing what's going on. I hate having nobody to handle things to. I hate that I feel like everything is a broken process. I hate working remote. I, not, I hate not knowing how everything I'm working toward is going to connect to something bigger. Wow, that's a lot of stuff that I hate. I hate my negative thoughts. It goes on and on and on. My list of things that were causing friction. I hate that I don't live with Chris and my husband. I hate that I don't see my friends. I hate that I'm constantly traveling in order to work. I hate the feeling of loneliness. It just goes on and on and on. Now, here's what's interesting. Life is trying to teach me something. And what my life was teaching me with a gigantic sledgehammer is that it's not working. It's not working. Wherever you have friction, there is either a broken process or a broken set of relationships, or there is something that is no longer aligned with you, or there are the wrong people around you. That's all that it is. And see, we get so attached to the way that things are that we don't get the lessons. And when you don't get the lessons, you close off what could be. And I'm here to tell you that you deserve to have a life where you don't feel friction every day. You're not wired to live a life where you feel that intense. And I can give you some other examples. Like, you know, when our son was in the fourth grade, he would just explode when we had to sit down and do homework at night, like full on temper tantrums. You know what that is? That is friction in a young person's body. That is him feeling this deep sense that something's off. And when that happened for our son and he would pound his head against the kitchen island and he would cry before he had to go to school, He didn't know what was wrong, but he was trying to teach us something. Life was trying to teach us something. His body intrinsically knew that something was off. And what turned out to be off is that the kid had profound dyslexia, profound dysgraphia, executive functioning, attention stuff going on, and he couldn't sit in the classroom and neurologically do what was being asked of him to do. And so I'm here to tell you, when you make this list of things that you hate, the areas of your life that create friction for you right now, that's where the lessons are. And those lessons will repeat until you learn them. Do not be stubborn. Do not look at the friction as if something's wrong. Look at the friction in your life as an opportunity to create alignment, as an opportunity to pull your life back into the other column, which is things that I love. And there was so much that I loved in my life. There was the therapy that I was doing. There was the time that I was spending with Chris and our son and building a house. There was all the new things we were working on. There was the podcast that was out in the future. All of this stuff. You got to walk toward the things. You got to do more of what's in alignment. But I'm telling you right now, the lessons are in the hard stuff. The lessons are in the friction. So that's lesson number one. Your life is trying to teach you something. It always is. Stop resisting the lesson. 
Because I have found in personal experience that if you refuse to learn the lesson, life will show up with a sledgehammer. When I look backwards now, I can see that I've been addicted to being busy for a long time. I can see that I needed to deal with this friction for a long time. It's just got louder and louder and louder to the point where I could no longer ignore it. I could also see looking backwards that I had often had people in my inner circle that were doing things like lying and betraying me, and I had ignored it, and I had made excuses for people. And so guess what? Those betrayals just got bigger and bigger and bigger until it was so painful that I had to finally learn the lesson. And so friction in your life is a good thing because friction wakes you up. Friction puts a spotlight on what's not working. And friction only builds everyone until you learn the lesson and you make a decision to turn toward it. Lesson number two, your excuses are bullshit. That's right. All those excuses you got, they're just fear. They are just fear. When you learn the lesson, when you turn toward the friction in your life and you look for either the process or the people or the place that you're living or the place that you work, all of the things, the thinking patterns that you have, the behavior patterns, when you start to identify everybody, all of the areas of friction in your life and you go to work to learn the lesson, here's what I want you to know. You are capable of changing it. You are 100% capable of learning the lesson and making anything in your life better. I know that is true about you. And that means that the only thing that is keeping you from identifying the things that aren't working and doing the work to move your life into alignment with who you're meant to be and the things that truly make you come alive, the only thing that's preventing you from doing that is you. And your fears, whether you're like any excuse that you have is just fear. You're afraid to try. You're afraid to fail. You're afraid you're too late. You're afraid of this. You're afraid of that. Now's not the right time. I don't have this. I don't have that. This person would be upset with me. All of it is fear. Fear of rejection, fear of it not working out, fear of dis- being, being disappointed, fear of disappointing others. That's what an excuse is. You're just managing fear. And it's all baloney. And I say that because I do the same thing. I do the same thing. I want to take you back just over a year ago. This was shocking when I started to prepare for this conversation with you. Because when I went back through my camera roll and I looked at my calendar, I realized that it was just over a year ago that I published my last book, The High Five Habit. I spent 20% of that book sharing about this big dream that I had about launching a podcast. So over a year ago, a year ago today, I did not have a podcast. I was still making excuses about a podcast. I was scared uh, about uh, launching a podcast. In fact, I wrote about it in this book. Just over a year ago, as I was promoting this book, I was making videos begging some of the biggest podcast uh, hosts in the world to have me on their podcast to talk about my book, The High Five Habit. So I made videos literally for the biggest, 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 the people that I admire. These custom videos, I put myself out there. I was all afraid, you know, about doing it. I sent these videos off to people that I love. I sent them off crickets. Nobody even responded. And I took that to mean I will never make it in the podcast business because the people I admire the most in that, they they don't even want to talk to me. They, they, They don't even respond. I mean, that's how big my excuses were. And I'm going to read to you a little bit about what I wrote. And this is just over a year old, you guys. So I want to put this in perspective as you're listening to me. As you listen to me right now, we are one of the top podcasts in the entire world because of you. We are the number one education podcast in the world on every platform because of you. 
a year ago, I was questioning whether or not I should even start this at all. And I'm going to read to you what I believed and felt in my heart. And I'm going to do this because there is something that you want to do. I had been thinking about launching a podcast for years. I had come up with so many excuses, so many reasons not to do it. There is something that is on your heart, that is on your mind, some change that you want to make, some art that you want to pursue, something that you want to do with your life. You know it. You feel it. You think about it. That was me with this podcast. And a year ago, I was busy talking myself out of it. I was busy looking for all kinds of reasons and excuses for why I, sh- I, it was too late, everybody. I missed the window. I should have done it years ago. See, you know, don't even bother. When I think about the excuses that I had, they're the same excuses you had. And see, you're seeing me now. You're seeing the success. So you're sitting there going, well, it's easy for Mel Robbins. She already had an audio book. Are you kidding me? I had the same excuse. I almost didn't do this. What a shame that would have been. And there's something that you're busy convincing yourself not to do. And that's why lesson number two is that excuse is bullshit. It's just fear. I had the same thing. Let me read to you from the high five habit, because this is what I put out in the world just over a year ago. You're seeing now what happens when you push through that stupid excuse. But I want you to understand, I get this. It's on page 111. Oh, yeah, I love this. Here's the title. I'm not giving this advice to you. I'm giving it to myself. (laughs) So this is a chapter about jealousy. And it's about excuses. And how I used to let self-doubt and jealousy eat me up inside. But here's the thing about jealousy. It's just blocked desire. It's a normal emotion. And the truth is, there's not a day that goes by when I don't feel a pang of jealousy. It happens every time I scroll through social media. And here's an example that I write about in this book. Because remember, when I published The High Five Habit just over a year ago, I didn't have a podcast. I didn't have a plan for launching a podcast. I was just writing about how jealousy was stopping me from pursuing it. It was eating me alive. So let me tell you about that jealousy I was feeling just a year ago. Right now, my career, when I look ahead of me, the people I'm most jealous of are the ones who have already started podcasts. For example, my friend Lewis Howes. He's been hosting the School of Greatness podcast for seven years. I'm extremely jealous of my friend Lewis. In fact, I got a bunch of friends who have hit podcasts, and I'm jealous of all of them. Too many friends to list. I never really thought about it before, but I'm surrounded by people who are podcast hosts. I'm jealous of them. And then, tell me if you do this too, I beat myself up for not having done it yet. I beat myself up and I come up with excuses all the time. Creating a podcast would be as natural and as fluid for me as drinking a glass of water. Why? Because I do audiobooks. I speak on stages. I don't like to write books because of my dyslexia and my ADHD. But why haven't I done it? If I want to do a podcast so much, why haven't I done it? And now I'm going to ask you the question. If you want to do this thing, whatever it is, travel the world, get healthy, write a book, change your career, go back to school, save your marriage, work on your... If you want to do this, why haven't you done it? I'll tell you why you haven't done it. The same reason why I haven't done it. Because you tell yourself you've missed the window. You tell yourself that it's never going to be you. You want this thing so badly. Just admit it. I wanted so badly to be a podcast host. I did. But you know what I spent my energy doing? Listening to my fears, coming up with excuses. I'm too late. Somebody else already did it. I can't do it now. I'll just be a copycat. Nobody needs to hear my voice. There's already five. Do you know there's five million podcasts on Spotify? Five million. I miss the window, everybody. And see, the truth is, when you start to write it out, all your excuses, you'll realize something I realized, which is 
It doesn't make any sense because there's nothing stopping you from doing it except for these stupid excuses. Nothing at all. Who cares that there's all these people that have already done? Who cares that your friend already renovated their kitchen and they have white cabinets and you wanted white cabinets and now you can't have white cabinets because then you're going to be a copy. Are you kidding me with these excuses? You can't go back to the gym because you haven't been in one in three months? Seriously? Do you know how dumb that is? You can't figure out how to be financially free? Do you know how many people who are stupider than you have figured that out? Of course you can figure that out. Your excuses are baloney. They're BS. It's just your fear. Just like my fear about being too late, not being good enough. You want to know the real deepest fear? The deepest fear is that I would finally pursue this thing that I'd always wanted to do. Because I've been thinking about this for a long time. You may not know this about me, but I got my start in local radio. I used to host a little call-in show Saturday mornings in Boston. I got paid $25 an hour to do. I loved that show. I, I fell in love with radio doing that show. I took on that job to help pay for groceries. It was a lifeline during a really hard time in my life. I loved it. And ever since then, 2007, I've wanted to get back to radio. And as the podcast market exploded, I wanted to get into podcasting. And you know what I did? I spent years coming up with excuses. Excuses for why I was too late. Excuses for why. And you're doing the same thing. Do you know how many times, everybody, I would say, it's too late. Mel, you missed the window. Everybody and their mother has a podcast. There's no way you're going to be successful. There's too many realtors, everybody. There's already enough nurses. How many of you have said that? Of course you have. There's enough books. Nobody's going to read my baloney. It's too late. I'm too old. Oh, I'm too young. I'm too young. I was talking with our son, Oakley. He loves streaming. Loves it. Loves playing video games and talking to the people that are watching and playing video games. Loves giving advice as he's doing. Loves doing it. And then we moved to a new school and he was really afraid because when the kids said, what are you into? He's like, well, I love to stream. And they're like, what? Boom. Stop doing it. Was afraid of what people thought. Again, excuses. If I continue doing this, I won't have friends. That's bull cocky, whatever the heck the word is. You know, I'm trying to, is that even a word? I don't even know. Who knows? But he hasn't done it for two years. And all of a sudden, because he has felt the pull the last two nights, and you know what I think it is? I think it's the fact that he was on an episode of this podcast and there was so much positive feedback about what he shared that something clicked and he realized his excuses are baloney, just like yours. And for the last two nights, you know what he's been doing after he gets his homework done? Streaming, giving kids advice. Is anyone watching right now? Nope, not a soul, but he's going to keep going. It's going to take time. And he kind of matter of fact last night, you know, came down for a, a glass of water in the kitchen. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm streaming. I'm like, well, right now? He said, yeah. He's like, nobody's watching right now. And I'm like, oh, and he's like, well, mom, it takes time. You got to show up consistently. That's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to stop this time because I was on a roll this time and I let my excuses and my fear stop me. I haven't done it in two years. I've missed this so much and I'm not going to let it stop me again. I love that kid and I love you. And that's why I'm telling you, your excuses, complete bullshit. You're not too late. You're not too early. Today is the right day. And you're not starting over. You're starting with all of the experiences of your life. You're doing this at the exact right time. This is perfect. You're listening to me today because you are meant to not only learn the lesson and start addressing the friction, but to one by one knock those excuses out of the way. And you know how do they do that? Action is the answer. Action is the answer. You can figure anything out absolutely anything. You can reverse engineer it. You can stalk people. You can figure out what they did. And one step at a time, one day at a time, you can start to align your life with the things that you truly want to do, things you enjoy doing with people that you really like. And you can push through your excuses one by one with the actions that you take. That's how I did it. I finally got so sick of feeling miserable so sick of the friction inside me, so sick of denying myself the freaking dreams that I have had held in my heart locked away. 
I was so sick and tired of myself that I'm like, that's it. I'm doing it. I don't care if nobody invites me on their podcast. I don't care if this thing fails. I'm not doing this for other people. I'm doing this for myself. And that's what you need to do. You're not doing this for the success. You're not doing this for the money. You're not doing this to impress somebody else. The changes that you need to make, the alignment that you need to bring your life into, you're doing this for you because you deserve to be happy. You deserve to see your dreams come true. You know how happy Oakley is? Sitting alone in his closet upstairs, streaming on Twitch while nobody is watching him. You know how happy he is? He is so happy because he has stopped feeling that tension and friction of knowing deep in your soul that you are denying yourself an experience that you want. And he is so happy that he has pushed through his own excuses and fears and that he has aligned his actions every night with something he's wanted to do. He has kept a promise to himself. That is the coolest thing in the world. That's what this is about. Like, who cares if nobody listens to this? Who cares if it fails in the eyes of the charts or whatever? Because that's not why you're doing it in the first place. You're doing it because you want to move yourself from a life that feels hard and friction and full of like resistance that you're putting in your own way. And you want to align your actions with the person you want to become. That's what this is about, everybody. And it took the hardest year of my life to get the easiest damn obvious lesson that there is. Mel, stop making your life hard. Stop putting energy into the crap that's not working. Stop making all this so personal. Everybody screws up. Everybody gets in toxic situations. This is not unique to you. Everybody has people steal crap from them or betray them. This is not you. You're not the only one. Stop tolerating this crap from yourself. And just look in the mirror and figure out what you're going to address and get on with it, woman. Like, enough. Enough. And I don't recommend that you have the hardest year of your life to learn these lessons. That's why I'm sharing them with you. I don't recommend that you get so broken down by your own bullshit that you have a mental health breakdown. I don't recommend that. I want you to figure out what's not working in your life what aspects you hate, what brings you friction, make the list, then get rid of your excuses by fixing this stuff. Absolutely everything in your life can be improved by you, period. And the only thing that's stopping you from doing it is your fear. And that fear is going to disappear the second you start taking action. One of the reasons why it's so important for you to get this on paper is because when you get this friction out of your head and out of your body and you give yourself the gift of putting it on paper. And I invite you to do this with somebody. Get a friend and together get a piece of paper out. This is what I do with my friend Pete. He's literally like, we need to remove the friction from your life because you're tolerating too much friction, Mel. Get with a friend because the friend will be a a truth teller. And you will be a truth teller for that friend of yours and draw a line down the center of the page and write shit I hate on the left and write things I love on the right. And for me, the left-hand column was way longer than the right-hand column. And what I'm here to tell you is you don't have to tolerate that much distress, that much friction in your life. You and I were just used to friction. That's why we tolerate it. You and I are used to the toxic dynamic in our family. We're used to uh, not going to the gym. We're used to feeling tired. We're used to feeling last on our list. That doesn't mean it has to stay that way. I am telling you, you have within you, if you can write that stuff down, you can figure out how to move yourself, inch yourself from the left-hand column, the shitty column, over to the right-hand column, toward liking and loving aspects of your life. I am in your life because I want you and I to enjoy our lives. It doesn't mean it's always a party, but when you can identify areas of friction, things just feel off. They feel harder than they need to be. It's a struggle. That means there is a person, a process, 
a place, there is a pattern, there is something there that you got to go to work on. That's it. Getting rid of friction is your job. Identifying it is the first step. Removing the excuses that keep you from taking the actions to smooth it out or remove it or improve it. There's your options. That's it. Remove it, improve it, do something different. That's it. Even just writing it down will make you feel better. And when you sit down with a friend and do this, they're going to call you out. They're going to call you out about the things that you complain on. Don't forget to put your marriage on there. Don't forget to put the fact that your back hurts on there. You know, you're always griping about blah, 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 blah. That's going to help you. And it's really, that's what I did with Pete. I got my little book right here. Got my list. Boy, when I read my list, I'm like, whoa, there was a lot I was tolerating. And I have gone step by step, one by one. And I have addressed it. See, here's the thing. You may not be responsible for creating the friction, but you have a responsibility to remove it. And you deserve that. That does not mean your life is going to be perfect. That means you are going to feel empowered. And this is not one of these one and done exercises because I now hunt for friction. If something feels off, like just yesterday we were uh, doing an uh, a episode for the podcast and I was sitting in a director's chair behind a table and I felt friction in my body. And I'm like, this feels hard. This feels weird. And then I noticed more friction. I don't want to ask the team to break the set down because we just put it up. And then I started to notice the excuses. I don't want people to be upset. I don't want to be a freak. I don't want to constantly change my mind. I don't. And I'm like, you know what? I am committed to living in alignment. I'm committed to making things easier. I'm just done with this. And so I'm just going to say what's not working and then we're going to address it and then it'll be over and life is easier. It's so much easier. Oh my God, you guys. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.